And we're going to go do (laughs) the thing that matters the most and be with the people that matter the most to us and all that. Welcome, everyone, to the Driving Vision Podcast brought to you by the Ziegler Auto Group. And here with me, Auto Group Director of Talent Development, Mike Van Ryan. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thanks, Sam. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast, like it if you do, and leave a comment. Coming up on today's episode of the Driving Vision Podcast, we're proud to have New York Times bestselling author Mitch Album. Mitch is a journalist, screenwright, playwright, and radio host who has captured the hearts of readers worldwide with his thought-provoking novels and memoirs. From Tuesdays with Maury to Five People You Meet in Heaven, Mitch's writing delves into the complexities of life, death, love, and loss, and the power of human connection. His latest book, Strangers in the Lifeboat, continues this legacy, and we are honored to have Mitch with us today to talk about his journey, both as an author and as one who is continually giving back to the world in unique and thoughtful ways. We go now to author Mitch Album. So the podcast theme is Driving Vision. And people with big visions have changed the world. You go back politically, you look at JFK taking people to space. Reagan brought a wall down. Others have done incredible things and brought people together with their visions. What is your vision of the world, Mitch, the better world? And how are you driving that today? Well, so you're starting with small questions. Uh, Yes. (laughs) uh, Well, I would say, you know, first of all, I think like everybody, my visions of the world have changed as I've aged. And I think the way you look at the world when you're 18 and what you want to accomplish in it and the way that you look at it when you're 60 are 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 and should be uh, very different things because you learn as you as you grow. And as I would say, at my current stage, my view of the world is that trying to change it um, globally, politically, you know, on, on a massive scale level is probably an impossibility. And the way that things get changed is at a ground level. And I have spent much of my time and continue to spend much of my time trying to do things globally, politically, you know, on on a massive scale level is probably an impossibility. And the way that things get changed is at a ground level. And I have spent much of my time and continue to spend much of my time to trying to do things at ground level. Uh, particularly with the charities that I'm involved with. So the charities here in Detroit, through the Say Detroit, I'm, I'm at them. I create them. I don't just go out and find funding for them or come up with some think tank idea of what they should be. We, we, you know, we, we go in and hands on and everything we do is you could go to it. You could go and, and experience it. You could go to our rec center. You could go to our medical clinic. You could see the people there who are benefiting from it. And, and then for me, a huge part of my life is an orphanage that I operate in Haiti, which I'm at it every month. Again, that could be something that you could just try to fundraise for, ship money over, and go visit once every couple of years. I, I've been there every month for the last 13 years. I, I select all the kids that end up coming in. I, I, I bring them up here when they go to college, and, and they stay here at my house. And, and uh, you know, I try to be a mentor to, to them, each and every one of them. So... For, for me, my vision of the world is to try to change it at a ground level um, for the good. And, 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 and an adjunct to that is to change it through children. I, as I get older, I find adults make less and less sense to me, honestly. I, I just, I'm baffled. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yeah. children make more and more sense to me. And um, I am surrounded by children and very happy to be. So you look at your, the accolades that you've accrued over your life to this point and author and journalist and screenwriter. And Mike and I were commenting, you know, how, how many how many uh, uh, news reporters and, and folks with the sports background have gone on to write songs that have been on Broadway and, and, and written books and been on television and radio? Your background is expansive. What, what is it about all of that which would buy you access to all sorts of privilege in today's world? Uh, what is it that has you putting that aside and going to Haiti where there is suffering and there's a challenge. You talk about that. You're drawn into that work somehow. You're not just mailing a check. You're doing it uh, and giving up some of the things that you could probably enjoy at home. What pulls you into that? 
Well, I, I guess, uh, Sam, I, I, I must find it more satisfying. I think most people tend to try to do in their lives what they find satisfying. And maybe for somebody else, satisfying is lying on a beach or in a, you know, f- or driving a fancy sports car. And I don't have any beef with that. I, you know, everybody has their own yeah. way of doing things. But I've, you know, I've been lucky enough to, I've been poor and I've been rich, you know, and, and I, I've, I've seen, uh, I've seen the truths of each one and I've seen the, uh, the, you know, myths of each one. And in the end, satisfaction doesn't come from things. Uh, doesn't come from reveling in your poverty and it doesn't come from reveling in your money. Uh, to me, it comes from making a difference in other people's lives. And, and in Haiti, I can make the biggest difference. I, I see exactly what I, what I think of to do that day. Hey, let's get some food here and feed these people. They're fed that day. It's not, it doesn't go through a bureaucracy and we don't have to have a majority vote on it and all the rest. Yeah. Of it. It's right then and there. And conversely, when disasters happen and, you know, someone, uh, one of our children has a brain tumor or one of them uh, suddenly starts fainting or whatever, I have to take care of it. It's right then and there. And, and, and hopefully I can. And so, you know, I, I guess it just I, I just I'm just drawn to doing things that make me feel at the end of the day like I have made things a little bit better, I think. I've had days in my life where I've done nothing but kind of, I guess, pamper my existence, you know, and I don't particularly feel that great at the end of those days. I mean, they're nice. Have one once in a once every few years or something. But to do that on a regular basis um, is just it's just not me, I guess. Yeah. And you go back to the book Tuesdays with more your 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 world renowned book, one of many, many number one New York Times bestsellers. You gave an interview where you talked about some of the advice that Maury gave you at the very end of his life, talking about how it's that being present in the moment, being here in the now. Did did that ultimately drive some of the trajectory and direction of your life towards oh, yeah. giving and charitable endeavors and, and efforts? Yeah, it was. It was. It wasn't driving. It was. It was the what do they call it? A forty-five degree turn. You know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was. Uh, you know. I really wasn't very much into uh, helping others or community or all that at that age at 37 when I was visiting with Maury I was pretty ambitious I would say most of my most of my time was spent on myself and my career and maybe that's why I understand the difference you know I I mean I wasn't I wasn't evil I don't think but I was certainly myopic I was definitely just interested in how can I advance how can I do better on ESPN? How can I be better known writing my column? How can I, you know, write more sports books? How can I, you know, get bigger, bigger, bigger? And uh, then more, you know, sitting alongside him and watching him die, someone who I really cared about and who I had known when I was a different person, you know, when you're in college and you're so open, you don't think you know it all, you know, uh, and I liked being with him because I it reminded me of when I was that way. And when, you know, when you're back in the presence of your teachers, your good teachers, you go back to being a student. You know, you go back to feeling like you're inside one of those desks and you're just younger. And I liked myself better when I was with Maury and I, I listened more. And one of the things that I listened to was him say that giving is living and, and taking makes me feel like I'm dying, you know, because I would notice that he would help these people who would come in to see him, but they were coming to comfort him, but he wouldn't end up talking to them about their problems and their, I mean, give them a therapy session. And I said, I don't understand. You can't move. You can't, you know, you can't eat. You can need to be carried from place to place. You're, you're the, the picture of sympathy. Why, you know, don't you just say, let's talk about my problems. And he said, Mitch, that's taking and taking just makes me feel more like I'm dying. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. And uh, I, I, that was a very profound moment for me and something that I've taken with me because I realized, hey, you know, if he's dying and this is what's making him feel good at the end of the day, this is what's making this is what he wants to do to, to hold off death. If we're like that in our normal lives, wouldn't that be the same? And I have found that to be true. So when I finish a day in Haiti and I go to sleep on a mattress that's, you know, half the size or a quarter the size of what I have in my house here in a room that you know, the, the the power goes off and it's 100 degrees and you're sweating and, you know, all kinds of reasons for you not to be comfortable. I sleep better there than I do here because I sleep knowing that I spent the day doing something that was important. And tomorrow I'm going to get up and, and spend the day doing something that's really going to make a difference. And so much of what we do in America, I think we're, we're blessed and we're cursed. You know, we're, we're blessed to have this wonderful existence and it's a very cushy existence relative to the rest of the world. Even those who are poor here in America have it better 
than so many other people in the world. Uh, poverty yeah. as it's defined in Haiti, yeah. which is the second poorest country in the world, and poverty as it's defined here in, in America with, you know, only one TV and, uh, and, and a, poor, a poor cell service for your phone, you know, and that, that is poverty in America, you know, yeah. still qualify. It's two different things. Yeah. And so to see people starving and to see people, you know, coming to our door and saying, take my children, I can't feed my children, you know, they're going to die if you don't take them. That, that makes you feel like you're doing things that really, truly change the world in a small way. And so that's how I think that giving is living thing is personified for me. It's what I'm going to talk about up there in Kalamazoo uh, next week when I, when I appear up there. You know, it's interesting hearing you talk. It occurs to me that your experience with Maury awoke you to that truth. Your ongoing experiences in Haiti continue to reconnect you with that. There's something to being in those situations. I lived abroad for a period of time in Ukraine when I was a, a high schooler. My wife actually lived in the Dominican Republic for a period of time. You mm -hmm. actually gain a sense of gratitude being in those situations. And yeah. somehow that connects you and reconnects you to that truth, doesn't it, Mitch? Yeah. Well, I think gratitude is very important. It's a, it's a highly underrated uh, attribute. Um, I think if you spend time, I try to every morning, just th thanking, uh, whether you believe in God or universe or just the world, and just I just rattle off for about 15 minutes everything that I have in my life that I'm blessed to have. And it's usually people. Mm. It's, you know, thank you yeah. for this person and thank you for this person. And I think all the fun that I've had with this person, all the laughs I've had with this person, all the joy, the love that I felt from this person. And um, by the time you're done with those 15 minutes, you feel pretty good about yourself, you know, and, and all it really is is just saying thank you. Thank you. And, you know, anyone who's ever had, you know, a surprise party or a tribute you know, or maybe have a retirement party or so, some kind of, or they honor you or something. And you have that moment where it's your turn to get up and, and kind of go around the room and, and thank everybody. And you're filled with this like, wow, you know, this is an, this is an amazing thing, you know, that I have to be grateful for. And, but those moments tend to only come when, you know, you have that big celebration of that party, whatever. And really we should be doing that every day. If you do yeah. that every day, you know, your your troubles will seem so much smaller because you started the day by saying thank you. So, you know, uh, it's harder than to spend the rest of the day saying I want, I want, I want, I want, you know. And I yes. think that, you know, that's a that's an equation that, again, I've learned as I've gotten older. I, I didn't know any of this stuff when I was young. You know, there's yeah. the, 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 the most blessed thing that you can have in this world is the ability to be given enough time to come to learn what you didn't know, you know. And and, oh, and recognize yeah, like, yeah. wow, thank goodness God's let me live this long to figure out what I was doing wrong back then and what I can do right now. You know, I would have hated to have been snatched while I was still making so many mistakes. You know, not that I'm not making plenty of them now, but hopefully I won't. I'll be around tomorrow. So 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 Mitch, Tuesdays with Maury, the best selling memoir ever published. I mean, congratulations. <laughs> what do you attribute that success? How come so many people out there are able to connect with that and, and read it and reread it? What do you attribute this success well, I think to? You just said it. I think you just said it is that people are able to connect with it. I think when, when a book sells that many copies, it's not my writing. You know, it's not people all over the world are going, oh, my God, you just have to read the writing. It's so incredible. You know, I mean, this book's translated into... 50 languages. I don't even know most of them. I can't even recognize <laughs> the books that have my name on the front of it. I don't even know that that's what it is. And, and, and yet it's being read there. So obviously it's not, not my writing. It's the story that everyone can kind of relate to. And, and I didn't realize this when I wrote it, but I do now after all these years that most people either have a Maury in their life, a teacher, a grandparent, yeah a parent or the guy next door on the rocking chair, whoever it was who kind of influenced them. And then most people can kind of see themselves in my character at that particular age, you know, sure. very ambitious and working hard and trying to get ahead, but not feeling particularly satisfied, wondering like, why, why is it, why don't, why aren't I happier if I'm doing all the stuff I'm supposed to be doing? And I find that whether it's the Japanese culture, the Chinese culture, the Australian culture, the Croatian culture, the Swedish culture, there's like parallels in all those countries to those kind of prototypes, you know, or archetypes. And, and, uh, and I think that's why people have come to it in the, in the numbers that they have and continue to do. In an interview, you've talked about how, uh, as Maury approached death, he asked you 
if you would continue to go to his grave after his passing and, yeah. and say, and have you continued to, to, to do that? And has that had an impact on yeah. your life? Yeah. So what he said, he said, come and talk to me at my grave, have a picnic, bring some blankets some sandwiches. And I said, wait a minute, you want me to sit there and talk to the air? And he said, yeah, just like we're talking now. And I said, well, it's not going to be like we're talking now because you won't be able to talk back. And he looked at me as if I were being very naive. And he said, well, Mitch, I'll make you a deal. After I'm dead, you talk, I'll listen. And, uh, you know, it was very funny, <laughs> but um, it was one of the few, it was one of the last things that we said to one another. And I always felt that that was not an accident. I think that uh, he knew what he was doing by saving that for the end, because, you know, if you really do have a life like he did, where you touch other people, um, I just read a report that said that they've done studies for now decades on this question of happiness, happiness, and what is the key to happiness? And what they came up with was relationships. It isn't money, it isn't status, it isn't satisfaction, it's, it's relationships. The better your relationships are with people, the happier you are. And Maury was exactly that. He led a life of relationships and he touched many people and he had, you know, he's close with so many people. Then when you die, you're not really gone. Those people remember you and, you know, you live on because you're talked about and you're remembered. And, and, um, yes, I do go to Maury's grave whenever I'm in Boston and, uh, I don't bring a sandwich, I have to say. I think, I think that there's maybe laws yeah. against that. I don't know that they throw you out as a vagrant or something, but but I do. Talk. You, also, you, you also hit gratitude too, right? I mean, that's another key factor in happiness. And, and Maury hits that when he talks about the window and what the window means to him, right? Yeah, I mean, well, right, right. Appreciation. Yeah, he said to me, uh, you see that window there in this room where we would always visit? I said, yeah. He said, you know, you can go outside that window anytime. You can go out right now and look in through it. You can you can get on an airplane and fly over it. You can drive past it. And I'm never going to do any of those things again. But I appreciate that window more than you do. And I said, what do you mean? He said, because I spend every day I get up and I look out through it and I say, thank you, God, for giving me this view that I have of these trees yeah. and I can see, you know, nature and everything that's out there. Whereas for me, I just walked past the window. It was just a window, you know? So, yeah, I mean, the whole trick of Tuesdays with Maury and the book and the whole kind of trick of, of life, I think, is to not have to wait until you get a terminal illness diagnosis to appreciate it. I think coming to those conclusions it's not easy, but it's easier once you know you're going to die. You know, if someone says, if I say to you two right now, listen, I just found out that the world is going to be destroyed in three hours. You're not going to stay on this podcast, okay? No. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to go, yeah, as, as, as important as this may seem right now, yes, yes. you're gone, all right? And I'm not going to stay on this podcast. Yeah. And we're going to go do yeah. the thing that matters the most and be with the people that matter the most to us and all that. But, but right. that's because you know what's coming. The trick is to be able to do the things that are satisfying and right without knowing what's coming and being prepared oh. any day for it to be the end. But maybe tomorrow isn't, maybe next week isn't, and maybe next year, the next 10 years isn't. But still to be able to live your life as if you knew that that was going to happen and have those two things converge. So when the day comes and they say, OK, this is really the day you go, well, I'm not actually going to do anything different because I've been living my life exactly the way. I want to in terms of priority, so I'll just have one more day of it, and then that'll be the end. That would be the balanced, perfect life, you know, if we could get to yeah. it. So, Mitch, you've accomplished so many things in your life, I mean, um, and had such success, and you're giving back in so many ways. What's next for you? What's the next thing out there? Next for me is just to see all these children, there's 60 of them at our orphanage, uh, get to college. You know, now we're bringing, wow. I have a baby here now that we're raising and she's uh, one year old and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. she had a terrible start and she didn't eat, have anything to eat but sugar water for the first six months of her life. And she was extremely malnourished and she only weighed six or seven pounds at six months. And, you know, she was wow. on, the, on the precipice of living and we've taken her in and, and thank God she's doing well and, and, and she's coming along and she's living with us for the time being. And now I say to my wife, well, now that's 22 more years that I have to be here in order to see her graduate college. And so, you know, that's what I, that's what's next is to try to last yeah. that long and, Time. and, see, and yeah. see these there kids go. go along. Yeah. I, I mean, there's many things that I would love to do professionally that I, you know, I'm yet to do, but if I didn't get to do one more thing professionally, 
I've already had as rich a life as anybody could want professionally. You know, you can't be greedy. Sure. Uh, and, but in terms of seeing the children that we have kind of taken on as our own uh, charges in the world, and we're responsible for them, to see them through to adulthood um, is, is my big goal. For those who are inspired by what you're doing in Haiti and some of these other efforts, are there ways our uh, national audience can join you, can contribute to this effort, not necessarily by going necessarily, but by giving. Is there, yeah, uh, sure. is there a foundation, yeah. Mitch? I want to just find out more about it. And then if they choose to want to help us in any way, um, it's very simple. The name of the orphanage is the Have Faith Haiti Orphanage. And the website is havefaithhaiti.org. On the web, the whole story is there. The videos are there. All our kids are there. <laughs> Endless pictures. You could be lost in that website for, for days. And it, it uh, you know, and if you so choose to help us, we welcome it. Absolutely. Well, Mitch, we absolutely appreciate the time you've been self with, with us today, sharing some of your experience and both uh, writing books, but also your your growth over uh, the, the span of your career. And uh, we are so excited to have you at Ziegler Auto Group inside our locker room to, to hear this message of giving is living. So we look forward to seeing you next week. And for our national audience, uh, check out Mitch Album in both the book, Tuesdays with Maury, but also your most recent book, Stranger in the Lifeboat. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks to Mitch Album for contributing to this week's podcast and to you, our weekly listeners, who make us one of the most listened to podcasts. Until next week, how are you driving vision today? 